Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Oates. I'm the president and CEO of the Hudson Valley Economic Development Corporation. We're super excited that you can join us today for our latest Back to Business webinar. Uh, today, we have Rick Alfondri, one of our uh, board members, who will be taking us through healthy buildings uh, in the age of COVID and beyond. Rick is a, a, a talented professional. He's got a great presentation. And Rick, I want to just get started right away and turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Rick Alfandre, Alfandre Architecture. i am uh, been in business almost 29 years. Our offices are in New Paltz, New York. In fact, this image is the interior of our office, which is in our building on Main Street, uh, which is the LEED Platinum Net Zero Energy, very healthy building. We are a team of six in office currently, probably hiring someone soon, new, uh, new soon. Uh, we're very busy, uh, mostly residential coming down the pike lately, but we focus on hospitality, religious, municipal, all manner of commercial projects and residential over these years. And I'm gonna show you a couple of those projects as I skim through the presentation. Uh, this is uh, Minnewaska Lodge in Gardner, New York, and I present it as em emblematic of my focus on environmental building and sustainable building and building with the environment. And uh, a lot of people have kind of called me the green guy over the years, and I've been very, very focused on environmental sustainability in the built environment. Um, but my research work all of these years has really been focused on what I think is the primary benefit of green buildings, which is health and wellness. And in fact, there's so much evidence now about how the built environment affects our health and wellness. <clears throat> it's almost overwhelming. And I wanted to, I think now it's really quite appropriate given our concerns about buildings and transmission of disease in, indoors. Excuse me. So I, I wanted to just walk you through, try to try and tie this notion of green buildings and sustainability with healthy buildings. Um, <clears throat> it's clear now with COVID lockdowns that uh, all of us really don't feel the same, that it isn't normal going back indoors in public buildings. Uh, and we're even thinking about our homes and what do we do. The reality is that prior to the pandemic, we were still very concerned about indoor air quality and health and wellness in buildings and productivity. And there's a lot of data to demonstrate that healthy buildings enhance cognitive performance and health. So the primary takeaways from this presentation, I, I want to move quickly. Time is, we're all very busy and I really want to be clear about what we're trying to get to. And we can always come back to the information. I can, I'm happy to talk with anybody, refer others, share the presentation. Um, <clears throat> the reality is that we need to have clean, fresh air for good cognitive function and that there is a direct and substantial economic impact, both personally, uh, locally, for any business, and for our country when we have good quality indoor environments. And this presentation is primarily focused on indoor air, but there's a lot of issues related to healthy buildings, but I, I, I wanna just really focus on the indoor air quality for now. It is very, very clear that COVID-19 is likely transmitted in the air. And so what do we do? How do we mitigate? Increased ventilation and better filtration are the two primary tasks or uh, building engineering elements that we can take to make our indoor environments safer. The other part, which we all really need to think about is that Many of us, most of our country, spend roughly 90% of our time indoors, either in buildings or in vehicles, mostly in buildings or in vehicles, which means that our indoor environments are a huge determinant of our health. And it's 
gotten to a point where we really need to be thinking more clearly about what we're doing with our indoor environments and how that affects our health. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to show this because I really love the quotes, but it also, in these days, I can't even imagine that the House of Commons would meet like this. Um, the reality is that our buildings do shape us. And so how we design them, how we build them, how we maintain them affects us. And now it's very, very clear with regards to our health as well. So what do we mean by good health? It's not just an absence of illness. It is the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health and it is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, et cetera. And this is from the World Health Organization, who I think we like. So very interestingly, just as the pandemic was really getting rolling, this book came out, Healthy Buildings, by Joseph Allen and John McCumber. Uh, Joseph Allen is with the Harvard Institute of Public Health, and the, John is with the Harvard Business School. And I invite you to take a look at it or to read more about what they've written. They speak very clearly about the, not only the fundamentals of healthy building, but also uh, the economics and the practical reasons why we, we should be making buildings healthier. So what are the, some of the tools that we can use? Uh, over the years, we've been using the LEED Green Building Rating System, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, which focuses on uh, the performance of buildings, but it has a big element that relates to human comfort and human well-being. But it's still, there's, it came out of the, the, the early days of green building being alternative energy and saving energy or saving resources and saving the planet, all of which is highly important. But the reality is that the big dollars are in the wellness of the occupants of buildings and our wellness in our environment. That's where we need to be looking at when we think about green and and sustainability. <clears throat> in the recent years, the well building standard was formed and the International Well Building Institute will rate buildings utilizing the well building standard. Similar, it's a similar process, although not exactly the same as LEED. But you can see that the focus is really on the individual's health and wellness. And there are areas of concern uh, within the well building standard that have nothing to do with, well, I'm sure they overlap with LEED, but they also, there are others that have nothing to do with LEED. <clears throat> so again, uh, we spend an enormous amount of time inside. Uh, ben Franklin was very concerned about it. And I think that the image up on the top or top left illustrates a lot of the way our buildings, not all, many, many buildings perform. And uh, many of us have spent time in conference, conference rooms where we've gotten tired because there isn't adequate ventilation, classrooms, et cetera. And the truth from this chart really shows that we, not everyone, but many, many people in this, this country spend well over 90% of their time indoors over the course of their lives, which is crazy. There's other figures that state that uh, some whales spend more time breathing air than we spend outdoors. Rick, These, go ahead. Answer just a quick question. As you as you talk earlier uh, in the presentation, you say you know obviously your business is 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 been very busy in the in, in the last uh, few months. Are you seeing uh, more interest from developers that 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 uh, you know building healthy and, and air quality is that is that increasing in the dialogue uh, right now, or is there still more of an educational uh, component to it that that that's needed? It, 
it is increasing in the dialogue, but there is a great need to explain where we are and what we need to do. Um, the, the, but the reality is, is that building very energy efficient buildings also helps us make healthier buildings because we create better enclosures which leak less energy and uh, less air coming in from odd places. We can then downsize mechanical equipment and then upsize ventilation equipment and make for better indoor environments. But buildings are complicated. They're not simple animals. And there's a lot of inertia with respect to cost and respect to way people have built in the past. Um, and even this conversation demonstrates that we're always learning. There's always new things to, to, to bring on board. <clears throat> but the, the, in the residential space, I would say almost everyone who contacts us says, well, you know, I really, I want to have a healthy home, you know, I, uh, but there's also the dilemma around the financing of projects. Uh, and that goes back to the appraisal of projects and, or the valuation. And uh, it's, it's a slow change in the market. There, it is, it is possible to convince appraisers that the projects that we're designing have a higher value, but it's still a challenge. So just these couple quick charts, probably people may have skinned it. It really shows that uh, higher ventilation rates in classrooms leads to higher scores and lower ventilation rates lead to lower scores. Higher temperatures in classrooms lead to lower test scores. Uh, you know, this is, this is huge when we consider uh, the scale of our educational system in the United States. And I will talk about that just briefly, but uh, a study that was done in 2015, National Center for Biotechnology Information, the U.S. National Library of Medicine indicates that a 5% increase in worker productivity would be equal to $186 billion in economic benefit in 2015. And that's year over year, it's every year. So what does that mean? Well, if we can enhance productivity and health, and that may mean reduced absenteeism, it may mean being able to do tasks more quickly, um, we can generate a huge amount of economic benefit. And that's not dealing with the education space or the, the residential space. That's just in the business universe. Uh, and it applies to offices. It applies to manufacturing facilities. It can apply to pretty much any kind of business environment. This chart illustrates, this came from a meta study uh, that again, from the National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, dozens of studies in various environments, hospitals, prisons, schools, demonstrates that lower ventilation leads to higher illness rates. And this is, uh, this was, this study was done after 2003, um, and then it was updated a few years ago the the rea pre covid and basically the the point is is that virtually any disease that <laughs> influenza rhinovirus pneumonia tuberculosis and obviously coronavirus is an infectious airborne droplet aerosol we've heard this over and over in the press and how do we deal with it additional ventilation how do we get additional ventilation in buildings that's another issue but it's very very important that we focus on this in all of our buildings, old and new, and especially as you know, going forward. And when we look at what the the economic damage to the to you know the to the economy from COVID is, we can begin to we can begin to extrapolate what the value of making these kinds of improvements would be. Uh, again, these are 2019 statistics, but I U.S. housing starts 1,200,000. Uh, U.S. commercial 
5.6 million buildings covered 87 billion square feet in 2012. Um, an increase of 46% in the number of buildings and 71% since 1979, but it's projected to go up to 126 billion by, 20, uh, by 2050. So, you know, we're looking at potential for building a lot of buildings. Yes, there are a lot of buildings that we need to also rehab. And some of those are obviously, it's harder to incorporate new systems into older, older buildings, but we really need to try. Uh, this is an interior shot of Minnewaska Lodge as well. So, when was that uh, project completed? Uh, 2001. And relatively new owners. The original owner sold it to Starwood Properties for a period of years, and then uh, Arcade Capital owns it now. Great, thanks. We're, yeah, we're doing some projects there as well. The, the hospitality space is still happening. Uh, <laughs> obviously, we're dealing with COVID. I mean, not we, but we are, but the, the operators are, and it's certainly a challenge, but they are focusing on on optimizing their their investment and having longer stays and it's a good thing this is again it's in Gardner it's a beautiful place so there's been a lot of discussion about how schools can go uh, children can go back to school or and and students can go back to college and the reality is is that it's a very difficult set of issues and almost every building is unique uh, 100, nearly 131,000 schools, 50.7 million students, 6.6 .6 billion square feet of interior space. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge. There's no doubt it's a challenge. And when we start to look at how do we manage the virus in the air, especially with buildings that have old ventilation equipment like this diagram describes, and many or perhaps most with rooftop units or, 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 win, or below the window unit ventilators with remote boilers, uh, difficult to service filtration, uh, difficulty in, in increasing ventilation. It's a, it's a big, potentially heavy lift. And I think that this is where the federal government and could come really come in when we talk about a green new deal, uh, the kind of investment in schools that is needed to, to truly make them healthy is big. And it's not just ventilation, it's thermal comfort, it's good daylighting, it's good interior materials. There's a lot of pieces to healthy building, but these mechanical equipment and the, and the associated issues about maintaining them are, are substantial. Um, we haven't done a lot of public school work, but we were fortunate enough to do some work for Rondout schools and we uh, did building condition survey for twice and we did a new roof on this Rosendale Elementary School prior to it becoming the Rondout Municipal Center. And these buildings typically have, they have a big rooftop unit ventilator. The filters are up on top of the roof. They're hard to get to. Uh, it's, they, have, they have plenum returns, which means that the, the air that's moving through the classrooms is going above the ceiling back to the unit. These are complicated sets of, sets of issues to be able to manage in a healthy way. And I'm, I'm not giving an answer per se on what to do other than I think that we really need as, as a society need to take a better look at this. When you go back to the fact that enhanced school environments increase test scores and performance and reduce absenteeism, what is the economic implication for our country? It's gigantic. When you're talking about 130,000 schools, over 130,000 schools, and over 50 million students. If we can improve absenteeism by 
one or two days, if we can improve test scores by five or 10%, what would that mean from on, on an economic benefit for our country? It's, it's gigantic. It's well worth the investment, well worth it. So housing, we've done a lot of housing, uh, a lot of single family residential, quite a bit of some affordable, I should say this one is AMCO, Tompkins Terrace in, uh, in, in Beacon. Uh, this residence is in, in Warwick. And again, this is the difficulty of investing. Uh, fortunately, the, the state uh, housing authorities understand green building better than they have. And I think that we're going to see even, well, they understand it well, quite, quite well now, we need to see uh, better ventilation systems in, in our housing, in our apartment housing in particular, and I'm going to show you some examples. Um, and these, by providing better ventilation in our homes, we also improve our cognitive function and our health and our well-being. Uh, just here's some other examples of projects we've worked on. The reality of the scale of the, the concern, 8.5 8 billion square feet of retail space in the United States. I would say that we are five times what Europe has in terms of retail space. So we've obviously seen that there's a transformation happening in the marketplace with malls. I think we're gonna to continue to see a downsizing of retail space in the country over time. It just seems like we have way too much retail space. So Rick, uh, if you could just go back a slide, you know, we, uh, uh, if you can give a, a little bit more information on what you did on the uh, Beer World, uh, you know, obviously Sonny Patel and, and the team of Beer World are, are also part of our board and Sonny yep. recently did a, a webinar for us as well on the craft yep. beer industry in, in the Hudson Valley. If you could just for a quick moment, just give us a, you know, kind of an understanding of, of some of the work you did on the Kingston store. Yep. Well, we, we help them divide the building. There's the Chipotle and uh, Wolberg electrical supply. We did the basic planning um, for the building, for the interior, for their permitting, as well as for the Chipotle. It's primarily, you know, permit type documents uh, to help them open up. Sonny has uh, a great brother who's, you know, just a, expert builder, uh, Jay, and so Jay and Sonny, you know, did their own contracting work. Um, there wasn't, it, we, there were, there were demising walls, but it wasn't a, a major construction project per se. That's pretty much utilizing, well, making a, an existing building much better. Great, thanks. You're welcome. This Anyone Can Whistle store, unfortunately, isn't there anymore, but this was, uh, built by the folks who uh, own Woodstock Chimes before the uh, 25th anniversary of Woodstock. And this was once the standard furniture store and it's uh, substantial gut rehab, structural work, quite a fun project. So we've done quite a bit of office space as well. This is the Prosthetic and Orthotic Associates building in the town of Wallkill. Uh, there's, 4 billion square feet of office space in the United States. And I would propose that the vast majority of it is underventilated and potentially unhealthy. Uh, this building has energy recovery ventilation, which I'll show you what that means. <clears throat> and there's a tremendous amount of manufacturing and warehouse and distribution space. There are a lot of studies that demonstrate that green manufacturing, meaning buildings with good ventilation, daylight, and thermal comfort are highly productive, um, that the workers in those spaces produce more safer with less absenteeism than buildings that are poorly ventilated, poorly lit, thermally uncomfortable, smell bad, things of that nature. And then, of course, hospitality. Uh, there's apparently roughly 54,000 hotel properties in the United States. Uh, this is the Emerson Resort and Spa in Mount Tremper. We've 
worked for Dean Gitter Pryor and Emily Fisher and Naomi Omhe uh, since the beginning. And this building, again, we have, well, this has ground source seat pump uh, system and it, it's thermally very comfortable. Um, hospitality spaces can be an issue with respect to providing additional ventilation, partic particularly in the in urban environments, um, being able to bring fresh air in, buildings that don't have operable windows can be an issue, and there's lots of reasons not to have operable windows in urban and suburban environments. Uh, but, I, but there are buildings that do have uh, energy recovery, and I'll show you one that we that you'll know of. So what do we do? Um, how do we make our buildings better today? And then what do we think about as going forward? There's a lot of pieces for new buildings to make them healthy. And it's not just about fresh air. It's how we build the buildings to reduce energy loss so that we can have downsized mechanicals and upsized ventilation. What kind of materials we select to make them better on the inside, less toxic, toxic and healthier. There's a lot of factors that we can discuss, but currently what do we do with the buildings that we have? Well, it, again, it comes back to increasing ventilation and increasing the filtration of recir recirculated air. It's not so easy to add ventilation or change the, the, the filtration that it sometimes has to be uh, engineered. So if you have a building that has air handling equipment, you probably need to talk to your mechanical contractor and possibly a mechanical engineer to determine whether you can add, turn up the ventilation. Uh, you can add carbon dioxide monitors. Carbon dioxide is primarily, is the generally the uh, gauge by which there's adequate fresh air in a building. And those that CO2 monitor can potentially be a control for the mechanical equipment itself. And again, it depends on how complicated the building is, uh, how old it is, what, how old the equipment is. It may be that it, given the life cycle of a particular uh, expected life of a particular piece of equipment, maybe now's the time to start thinking about upgrading equipment and systems in your building or on your building as obviously we have a lot of rooftop units as well to improve ventilation and filtration and controls and probably reduce energy costs at the same time. And then of course there's buildings that you can open windows which is great sometimes there's controlling access to buildings, cleaning surfaces and now PPE. So here we are, Mike, me, uh, Senator Schumer with our masks on, uh, thank goodness. This image in the middle is our office building in New Paltz. We installed, we already have enhanced ventilation and improved filtration, but we installed uh, controls at the entry door to prevent just walk-ins. Now every business can't do this, but um, office buildings certainly can. And uh, we put in a new buzzer system that ring, it's a ringer, it rings the office phone of a particular office. There's a camera and people can let someone in or not. And then this is a common CO2 monitor te and temperature monitor that can be used for uh, regulating mechanical equipment. Now here's, uh, energy recovery ventilator. This particular device is in our office building. It's in an attic that's underneath the conditioned envelope. They can exist in basements. They can exist on roofs. There's different kinds. And it, they're fairly simple. This, most of them at this scale use a coil like you see here. These are either metal or plastic usually where the airflow flows through the coil uh, in two directions and uh, it brings in 
fresh air from outside, exhaust stale air from the building, and then it exchanges the majority of the energy from inside the building into the air that's coming into the, the fresh air that's coming into the building. Now, in this case, ours is set up to pick up exhaust from the bathrooms, the kitchenette, and the basement. They can be set up in a variety of ways. If you had a retail operation, say, and I'm not saying that Beer World needs it, but as an example, Beer World, or you have a rooftop, you can install an ERV on the roof. It could pick up stale air from, say, above the cashier and maybe from the bathrooms and bring in fresh air into and dump it into the distribution system in the, in the building, as an example. Uh, <clears throat> there are other kinds of, of energy recovery devices. This one is, is a wheel, it's called an enthalpic wheel. It's used for uh, much larger air exchanges. Uh, and we have a similar one to this size and scale in, the, in this building, which is the new Friary of Graymore in Garrison. Uh, and this building is, in, is constructed of insulated concrete form up on the mountain, it connects the old historic Friary and the uh, other buildings at Graymore. But the, the idea here is that there are energy recovery devices of at all kinds of scales for all kinds of buildings. And certainly it's difficult to retrofit a large device like this into a building, but if they're designed in, uh, it's not that difficult. This is a small one. This is a residential size device. It's very common. And I don't think that any home new or renovated or apartment should be without one. And again, they can be set up to do, depending on the situation, if it's a renovation or new, they can pick up stale air from bathrooms, kitchens, wherever, exhaust it to the outside, bring in fresh air and put the fresh air either directly into spaces or into an air distribution system if there is an air handler of some type. Um, just quickly, this is the Hampton Inn in New Paltz, and they do have an energy recovery system. Now, Jay Mudwadia, and I, and I believe they, and I know they have it in Kingston as well, and I'm probably in Matamoros. They, Jay is uh, an adamant energy saving person. He understands the issues, but what what he's done is he's created a situation where he can bring additional fresh air into the building and create a healthier, demonstrably healthier and easily de uh, marketable feature of the hospitality facility that is not yet common. Although there are requirements for minimum amount of ventilation by using energy recovery, we can add ventilation without using more energy. So filtration, uh, there are, uh, filters are, are classified as MERV, by MERV, unless they're HEPA, minimum efficiency rating value. And it's stated in the, in the press recently that a, a minimum of MERV 13 will capture, um, will likely capture COVID particles circulating through the air. So where are we putting these? We're putting these in air handling equipment. Uh, if so, in other words, most built, not most, mo the vast majority of buildings have some air conditioning and they, they move that air conditioning with duct work. Although we have mini splits now, many, many buildings have air handlers. So these filters, these like this one in the, in the top middle of the image uh, are, typically paper, sometimes paper coated with, with, um, with uh, charcoal, with, uh, with carbon, which this is, activated char uh, carbon. Uh, and the, this little filter on the right is actually the one that's in the, the uh, ERV, the energy recovery ventilator. So those also have to have fil filters and they'll pick up dust and dirt and po pollen from the outside and they become 
they become particularly applicable in urban and street environments where we have apartments and houses, having an ERV with filtration, and then possibly even having an air handler with, with filtration, not only improves the amount of ventilation in an apartment or a house, but it also reduces pollutants, other kinds of pollutants in the house. And then of course we can open windows, hopefully, unless we're living in a dirty and uh, poor polluted environment. And just wanted to summarize a little bit with some uh, information from about how to how do we calculate what we're what we're what we're talking about? This is our building in New Paltz, and it's 5,400 gross square feet above grade. I don't remember what the net usable is, but it's insulated concrete, concrete form walls, uh, structural insulated panel roof. It's very very airtight with high efficiency mechanical equipment and energy recovery ventilation. Uh, and low emitting materials selected throughout. There's approximately 27 full-time employees in the building, you know, six or seven tenants, I can't remember, including Alfondra Architecture. So I'm just taking a guess and saying that the payroll on an annual basis is at least $2 million, which equates to nearly $375 per gross square foot in payroll costs. So what, what I'm trying to do here is say, okay, the, the average rent is just around $30 per gross square foot. So clearly payroll is 10 or more times the cost of rent. So why are we focusing on the cost of rent when we're leasing, if we're, if we're looking for space? What we should be focusing on is the quality of the space and how that's going to affect that dollars per square foot for payroll. Another way to look at it is a 1% increase in productivity equals a $20,000 increase in or benefit, which is a $4 per square foot benefit. Uh, and you know th these numbers can trickle out into the bottom line of, of any tenant or any landlord. Uh, and I feel like we're undercharging given the value of, of the building. And, and other ways to look at it are absenteeism. If, if one day of absent, uh, absenteeism is reduced on a, let's say, 242 day per year uh, work year, it's, it's tens of thousands of dollars of benefits saved or you know, contributed to the tenants. So, and then this chart, the, again, we're going back to, to Joseph Allen, that the, they're, they're stating that employer, employers are, are reporting up to 10 sick days per year from employees. That's huge. If we can reduce that. I, I, I don't see that in our building, but that's huge. So how do we do it? We, improve the indoor environment by reducing carbon dioxide, by, by increasing ventilation. And uh, we just make our indoor, the quality of our indoor environments better. This is another study that's fairly recent in the last few years. And I bring it up because it's a New York state based uh, facility, the Syracuse Center of Excellence, which is, if you've never seen it is quite a, quite a place and the Harvard School of Public Health working with COE and Upstate Medical cre created a double blind study where they had people come into work in, the, in their office environment at the Syracuse Center of Excellence, do the work that they normally do. And they created three air quality environments, a typical office environment, a low volatile organic compound environment and a low volatile organic compound and high ventilation environment. They, nobody, none of, the, none of the subjects knew what they were walking into uh, and none of the people who gave the cognitive tests after eight hours of work to the subjects knew what was happening in the environment. What they found is that 
by reducing pollutants in the environment and or by increasing the fresh air, doubling it effectively, the, in other words, diminishing the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the, in the work environment, the, te the subjects, their, their, their cognitive function doubled on this cognitive test that the Upstate Medical Center has given in the past to tens of thousands of subjects. So this is a, a well-known test uh, and effectively what, what it's demonstrating, and granted it's a, small, it's a small subject group, by making healthier indoor environments, we are much smarter individuals. And uh, who wouldn't want to be? I mean, it, you know, what, what is it worth? Now, if we can translate that from, if we, we, we can begin to create, figure out what the economics are in work environments, how do we figure out the economics in home environments? It's harder to translate because we're not taking uh, acuity tests at home. This is just uh, probably the last slide of any relevance. This is from the Department of Defense from 2002. The numbers are, are different, but it, effectively what it shows is that a 3.7% increase in productivity over a 30 year life of a building pays for the building, the payroll costs, the first costs, and the operating costs it pays. So in other words, it pays for the building, pays for all the pay, pays for everything by increasing the occupants or the workers' productivity by 3.7%. Now that's Department of Defense, a 2002 study. The numbers are off the charts now. So again, there are many ways to calculate and, and illustrate, I guess, the benefits of better indoor environments, uh, but there's no doubt that the health, wellness, and productivity values are very large and outstrip the cost to make the necessary changes. Uh, I, you know, I would leave it there. I think that we have a lot of work to do. There's a lot of inertia in the built environment. There's a lot of inertia in the uh, tenant uh, landlord environment. There's, uh, it, it, Things are expensive and complicated, but I think we're at a stage in our the, the development of buildings where we really need to be taking a much harder look at making much healthier indoor environments. And this is why I do it. Obviously, my daughters, uh, they're home, going to their juniors. Uh, Joy's starting next week, and. It's sad that they're not going to to college, um, but you know we, we keep on we keep on keeping on. With that Mike, um, well, Rick, yeah, no, you. obviously, thanks for for the presentation. I think it's pretty clear why you're you're called the green guy with your with your uh, uh, years of expertise. I, I I would encourage people uh, on either on the residential or the commercial side that want to know more about uh, this subject. Uh, want to start thinking about ways to make, uh, you know, future buildings and existing buildings uh, healthier and improve the air quality. And you can see from Rich's presentation how absolutely critical it is to, uh, to help, uh, you know, help improve pro productivity and ultimately, uh, you know, make your businesses more, more profitable and more sustainable. So I would encourage you, uh, we have it on the screen right now, which is uh, Rick's uh, contact information. Uh, if you're interested in getting this, uh, this deck, you can read the reach out directly to Rick. You can reach out to, uh, to uh, us, uh, myself at, uh, at HVDC. We're happy to share that with you. Uh, yep. So Rick, again, thanks for, for, uh, uh, for your presentation. And, and I, again, I would encourage anybody to, that wants to learn more to really reach out to Rick, he really knows this uh, this stuff inside and out, and could be very helpful uh, to you on on meeting your your building needs. So uh, again, thank you for joining us this morning. I want to thank Focus Media, Orange County Chamber of Commerce, Jeremy Ellenbogen with Ellenbogen uh, Creative Media for helping us put these uh, webinars together, and we look forward to seeing you at our next one. So have a good day, everyone. Thank you.